Errol Brewster, how wonderful. Thank you for joining us at Guyana Speaks today. Um, I think we're probably going to speak for about 30 minutes. And I would just like to start with the first question, which is, who is Errol Brewster? What a question. <laughs> morning to you, Bonita. Thank morning, you morning. for having me. <laughs> but that question is a very telling question. Because I, of course, have been trying to make a name for myself in the visual arts for 40 something years. That you feel the need to ask that question means I didn't have much luck. I didn't do very much. In, <laughs> I didn't do good at all. But in these two minutes that you're allowing me here, I am going to launch myself on the world stage. Okay? Go for Let it. Let me tell you who that is. Gerald Brewster is a gorilla, is an art warrior. I love art. I love to talk about art. I love to make art. I've been making art since I was three years old. The most recent of my works I would like for you to play now, the Mamala, the Mamala. The Mamala. <laughs> yeah, Mamala. OK. Yes. It, I'm just going to go. You go for it. And then when you finished, I'll share the screen. OK. The Mamala is a, is a public art intervention. I illegally and surreptitiously painted her portrait on a bus stand, on the side of a bus stand. It is a perforated uh, material so that you can see the portrait as well as you can see through to the inside of the bus stand. And the whole idea behind that is for people approaching the bus stand to see others like themselves in her image. So it is a celebration of a Caribbean sister that has acceded to the highest office. Huh? It's a significant thing. And so I felt the need to celebrate it. But guess what happened? No sooner was I finished, and I'm lucky that they waited until I was finished and they didn't pounce on me whilst I was doing it. They erased it by repainting it within 24 hours. But it had been my intention to repaint it myself. I intended to restore the bus stand its original way because I know that I am doing something that I shouldn't be doing. What, it, what my objective really was, was in making a film of the doing so that I can put it out to the world. And I would like you to do that now so that you can get a sense of who this warrior, this gorilla, this public art warrior, yes. <laughs> so here it goes. Now, let me just lift up the screen and play. Come on, come on, come on, set me free! Real equality. Mama, mama la. Everything is gonna be all right now. End of an era. Not E-R-A, E-R-R-O-R. Oh. Bring on the girl. <clears throat> I hope your um your viewers will find this interesting and enjoyable. I'm and sure understand that the, that the authorities <laughs> didn't. There is a there is an atrocious piece of graffiti on the other side where that man is standing. They did not remove that. They removed the beautiful face of our vice president who is going to change this country significantly. So this was actually after the inauguration, was it? This is on the very day. On the very day, okay. <laughs> and who is your partner in crime? So who's the there person? There is no partner. These are passerby who are going by. I'm alone. I'm a lone warrior. Okay, so you set you up the no camera partners. yourself. <laughs> no partners. Okay. You're gonna walk and don't look back. Everything is gonna be alright. <laughs> <laughs> I see truth <laughs> revealing. That's right. <laughs> I see truth revealing. Oh, that's, that's a little fantastic. taste of how I approach art. I see art as social engineering, really. But let me tell you about myself here. I, um, I was the last child in a family of four. 
with very big brothers, brothers 16 years older than me. So that I got a lot of insight into what life was like that was way advanced of my own maturity. But the thing that made me an artist, I think, is the fact that my father was a, what the hell I could describe him? He was, he was a highly aspirational, lower working class man. He was a civil servant and his economics did not afford us uh, the opportunity to live in a neighborhood or a community that he would have liked. And he felt that the community in the neighborhood that we lived in was not the right influence for me. And so I got parked at the window. I could not go outside and play on the hand cricket and roll roller and play, bring a ring of roses and watch the masquerade and things. I had to watch from the window. It made me into a keen observer, it made me into a documentarian, and it made me into a lifelong diehard supporter of the underdog. It didn't alienate me, as he may have thought that it would put a distance between me and this neighborhood. It made me embrace them. And so all of my work really is concerned with the struggles of ordinary people. So, um, so amongst the, Errol, amongst I, just wanna, the I just wanna say for the people who don't know, people like me, so you were brought up in Georgetown now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm from uh, Guyana. Yes, we know, we know you're from Guyana. We know you're from Georgetown. What era are you, is this going on in? I mean, what, what are you talking well, about the 1940s? this is going on in a time when the, I was born in 1953. 53, This okay. is the beginning of the modern political period in Guyana. Right, And right. it has been tumultuous and full of turmoil ever since. I was a nine year old looking through the window in Regent Street in my uncle's house as they burned down their own city as they beat the hell out of each other, scrambling people off of their bicycles and beating the hell out of them. This is me at nine years old. This is what I'm witness to oh. in my family, like I tell you. For one thing, my, my father was um, the, the child of Barbadian immigrants. So we were not like fully integrated into Ghana. We didn't know anybody. We'd had no other relatives. We were a nuclear family. It was my father and his brother. And these two brothers married two sisters. So we were a very insular, uh, kind of unit. And uh, of course, though they were not um, actively involved in partisan politics, it was a huge concern of theirs. They paid very strict attention, read all the newspapers, lugged me along to all of the political meetings at Border Green. So I was fully politicized as a child. As a child, I'm highly politicized. But this, they were supporters of all of the parties in the family. So the discussion raged and uh, about uh, the, the, the virtues or, or the problematic aspects of all of these parties. And I am, of course, attuned and listening to all of this. I don't know to, the, to what extent at the time I'm understanding it, but what it did was to give me a sensitivity to matters related to politics of the country. And so that has always been a base concern of mine. And you will see it in the work that I do. Um, <clears throat> uh, amongst, the, amongst the images that you have, there are several of them that are Polit political images. There's the abdication, an old woman trudging along as a, a, a big crab emerges from the parliament buildings to swallow her up. These are not exaggerations. The government of the day let the palms, which is the home for the indigent, fall down itself. The city hall is now similarly falling down on itself. We have a weird attitude to ourselves, but I'm telling you about myself and how I came to be. I'm doing this since I was three years old. I have a cousin, Sandra. You wouldn't have to ask her, or if you did, you'd have to have a, a program of the last couple of hours if you asked her who she was, because she's a very notable Canadian artist, born in Canada to Guyanese parents, but grown up, born and grown in, in, in Canada and fully integrated into the, in, in the art scene. Has a wonderful career. What she is doing now, the transference of pictures from one surface to another, denoting all the sociological ramifications of that is what I was doing when I was five years old. Of course, I had no sense of the sociological ramifications of anything. I was just transferring pictures. I love pictures. When I was tired drawing them, I started transferring them from the newspapers. So as I'm going along through my life making art, as I tell you, I have big brothers. They are in the theater guild, they are on the national basketball team. They're going to school with people like Wordsworth MacAndrew. They're friendly with Stanley Greaves and Ron Savory. Dennis Williams is a friend of my family. So art is uh, a part of my ambiance. 
So this idea of how, when did you decide to become a professional artist? I never decided that. I was an artist from, from, from the time I knew myself. Also, I didn't really have any sense of what a professional artist was. All of these artists, people whom I tell you about, they did other things. They were broadcasters or teachers or administrators or architects or whatever. Nobody was a professional artist who just did art and earned their living doing art. There was no, no, no such thing went on. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> I, didn't have, I, didn't, I didn't make a decision to be a professional artist. I was just an artist and I went along. When I graduated from high school, um, I did well in language and in literature and in history and in art and in mathematics. So I could have gone in any direction within the liberal arts. But um, I decided I wanted to work because I wanted girlfriends. And I felt that if I had a job, a lot of money, that I would be able to get them. Nothing, of course, is, that is completely untrue. I never had any real money in my life. But I had a lot of girlfriends. A lot of girlfriends without money. <laughs> so I don't know why I had this idea. But, I, but anyhow, it led me to apply for the best job a high school graduate could get. I went to work with Barclays Bank DCO. Well, I am wow. supposed to be counting out the people's withdrawals and taking in their deposits, but I'm busy drawing the, the, the customers in the line. Of course, I'm making a lot of mistakes. So I got to stay back late in the night trying to get my tilt to balance. I said, listen, hey, let me finish with this thing. Though. I'm going to take off to art school. I could have gone to Jamaica. Jamaica had an art school. But I didn't think that Jamaica was a 24-hour society in which I could go to school in the day and work in the night. So psh, off to Canada with 24-hour society. I have family there. The same Sandra, her father is my cousin. So <clears throat> that is my launching pad. Set myself off and I'm at the art school. The art school I've been to, 100-year-old art school. However, the year before I got there, they turned the whole pedagogical approach to teaching of art on its head, threw all of the nonsense out. The school reinvented itself as a fully equipped school in a wide range of areas. You could do from serigraphy to holography. And so I took full advantage of that. And that is how it is that my work is expressed as drawing, painting, photography, film, computer graphics, design. That is. It is, it is as, a, as a direct result of the exposure to various media and technique and approaches uh, that that school gave me. <clears throat> so now I'm graduated from the school. I never got any scholarship. I never took any scholarship, but I returned home. This was a period in the 1970s when the government was giving out scholarships left, right, and center. Thousands of people took scholarship. What they wanted was for you to serve in the national service. I don't know what the hell is national service, standing up on a, on a drill square, dressed up in a bullshit uniform with, with a toy gun. No, no, no. I said to them, listen, the national service I would like to do is to paint murals on the children's, on the walls of the children's ward of the hospital, the public hospitals. Send me to Mahaika, send me wherever you got your hospitals. I will paint murals on the walls that will interest the children. No, 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 sir. We just need for you to uh, march around on that square and say, hey, Keep your scholarship. I can shovel snow. So I gone back. Shoveling snow, painting walls, doing whatever it is I have to do to survive. But I returned all of the thousands who they gave their scholarship to who marched around on that drill square, they all disappeared into the metropolis of New York and London and Toronto, wherever it is the hell they went. I am back. What am I going to do? I'm like an astronaut now. I study in holography. These things that nobody in Ghana knows about. We have no materials to support it. We, have, we, have, we, we, we don't have electricity. We don't have bread. Bread. Stanley gives us a painting called Big Bread. <laughs> bread is such bread is a, is a big thing. And people stand up in line around the block to buy bread. So where are you going with technical photography? Where are you going with? But anyhow, I teach in the art school. That is how this society is. Me just out of an undergraduate college, tutor at the National Art School. What I know about teaching. I don't know a thing about teaching. You know what will happen? I'm going to head that art school. What I know about heading art school. Eh? I don't know nothing about heading art school, but I head in the art school. <laughs> That's a hell of a society. We are a hell of a people. We are the most modern people. We can do anything that we put our mind to. What's the next question? 
Well, one of the things I wanted to know was what's your, I mean, because you have a very varied approach to art. What's your favorite medium? You know, medium and technique and process is, are insignificant to me, really. The heartbeat of art is image. And that image has to arise out of a foundational idea. Yeah. Philip Moore was a man who didn't care whether he had art experience or how experience. Because image is what it is. Image is the heartbeat of art. So I'm not concerned with what computer program you use. I show people myself, what computer program you use. Come on, man, engage with the work. Where are you going with what computer program I'm using? What difference does it make? Corel Draw, Photoshop, Illustrator, what difference does it make? Image, that is where the art is at. It's, so it, 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 it's interesting as well because I see you very much as a documentarian. I mean, I watched the I watched the film that you did on Philip Moore, and I you know mm -hmm. I loved that whole introduction with the sort of Afro Guyanese culture and how it leads to this understanding of how coffee becomes produced. You know his 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 style right. and his technique and stuff. I thought it was very um, eye opening. But I notice you do a lot of you produce a lot of documentaries of other artists. I do. I, I, do. I love art. I love to talk about art. I love to make art, but I don't talk too much about my own art. I'll talk about your art. Other people's art, they're ready for that. But my art, I'm not so keen. But it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, this whole idea of writing art is statement. I'm, I'm, I'm a little curious about that because I am of the view that artists are not really able to examine themselves, to understand what are the influences at work in their own work. I don't think that um, artists have that high degree of self-awareness that they could analyze their work and see in it what is influencing it and stuff. So this idea of artist statements, I avoid things like artist statement and resume and uh, you know, I just want the concentration on the work. I, I think that's, I, that's, that's why I wanted to hear you say who you were, because <laughs> I've seen a lot of people <laughs> write about you, but I've never really seen you write about yourself. Well, and, well, um, so I was interested in, in, in how you saw yourself. And I think it's why I mentioned to you the other day um, that I like the, there's a, I can't remember who wrote it, but somebody said resistance is a secret of joy. And it's, well, a, it's a statement that stayed in my head for a long time because I've always seen you as a guerrilla artist. <laughs> um, and and I, I sort of, because of that, I thought that you must have been so interested in politics that when you create, you have something very definite that you want to say about a, the political context or the political times. So I sort of thought that, you know, I always think it's really interesting. Artists say um, that the viewer should decide what a painting means or that kind of thing. But I, I, I wonder, um, it just feels a difficult thing as that, that as an artist, you produce a piece of work and then you have to listen to other people's interpretations. How do you feel when their interpretations are completely different to the interpretation you would have given to a piece of work? I fully expect that. I am of the view really that the viewer is who finishes the work. The work when you create art, it's your art. Mm -hmm. When it's exposed to people and they recognize and it resonates to them, that's when it's art. It ceases to be your art, it's now art. And so mm -hmm. they have full reign for its interpretation, for its understanding, for they do with it whatever they wish because they who are making it. I'm just doing the magic that sets off the um, the perceptions in other people's minds. That's all I'm doing. So, so, so it doesn't it doesn't worry you uh, not no, being not able to no. commute commu communicate a particular message doesn't really worry you or. Well, I don't think that it doesn't communicate that message. Okay. I think that it communicates other messages as, as well. well. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Though, though the extent to which the message that I intend is in fact communicated is questionable, dubious, it fluctuates. Sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I'm not. Sometimes, sometimes it, 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 they don't get it at all. <laughs> but none of it matters to me really because I am so in tune with the making of it. When I'm done with it, I'm done with it. You know, a lot of them I put in the garbage. <laughs> That's very sad to hear. I'm done with it. I'm only interested in making it, you know? Yeah. I was not one of these artists who had exhibitions and made a lot of sales and then several collections. I wasn't lucky in that way. I was lucky in the way that I could do whatever the hell I wanted. I could do whatever I want. That's constrained by any expectations of me 
or any desires to please anybody or I, a line in one of these films that I made here, 40 Pieces of Political Art at ERB, says, to be celebrated, your work had to show that you were sedated. Dennis Williams' wife took offense, took objection to that. So I had to remind her that Dennis Williams himself censored artists. Basil Thompson, one year, painted a homeless woman, a wonderful painting. The subject was not a wonderful one. Dennis felt that it was an embarrassment to the authorities, and so he would not allow it into the national exhibition. That's if your work didn't show that you were sedated, you couldn't be celebrated. Converse is true, so you understand what's going on with all of these celebrated artists. Yeah. But um, some other things I want to tell you about, uh, forgetting now. I want to point to you, but I don't remember many things. So ask me another question. Well, so one of the other things I, I wanted well, I to wanted know. I wanted to tell you about this, uh, this Philip Moore film. Yeah. You're in trouble with me about this Philip Moore film. You are in deep trouble with me about this film. I saw this film, surprisingly. What? I am in the Guyana Speaks page. What? But the thing is, the thing is just day like it fell out of the deep blue sky. There is none of this glorious introductions that you write for all of the other cultural things of note that you put on that page. There is not even an attribution as to who it is that made this film. You know how hard it is to make a film in 1995? Dennis Williams said to me in 1974, and I thought he was absolutely out of his mind. He took me one day, one year that I returned home for the August holidays, for the summer holidays, took me to see his newly installed 1763 monument. He put the damn thing up on a high, 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 high pedestal. That was never Phil Fillmore's intention. So my intention is to get it back down on the ground. Let coffee on the ground. Let him walk among us so we can absorb his aspirations, his ideas and stuff. But anyhow, Philip Moore, and Philip says to me, you are going to make a film about this monument. I says, me? How? When? He says, never mind, it will happen. 18 years later, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and you go and put it on the Guyana Speaks page and don't even say that is me put it. You got some good lashes to get here, I tell you. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no, but it does, it does, it says your name. Weird. In the credits? Who reads the credits? You read the credits to any film? Huh? <laughs> Who were the sponsors of that film? Who were the sponsors of that film? Oh, damn. Who in that film? Oh, you don't know. No. Nobody reads the credits. You have to write your introduction. You can get licks. Um. Ask me another question. No, you know what it is it, with with the Guyana Speaks thing. We try and put something on every day, but because both of us are working, we don't have that much time. <laughs> so sometimes I just pop it in there, and I hope I hope people will watch it and then get engaged and kind of tease out their own conversation yeah, from it. Get, get more licks with all this. But, uh, but yeah, okay, I, I accept. I accept. I sat in a meeting. <laughs> in a meeting with cultural officer of the Caricom Secretariat. You know what she says? She has the audacity to say, when we are ready to make our plans for Carrie Festival, we don't know who are the artists to speak to. She says, excuse me? When you are ready to make economic plans, you don't know who the economists are? The whole thing smacks of the general disrespect and disregard that our society has for the artists. We don't have an appreciation of what the, who the artist is or what he does, she, he or she does. But CARICOM cultural officer doesn't know who the artists are, whom she should consult with in the making of plans for cultural matters. I mean, that says it all. <laughs> no, completely. But so um, one, of the, one of the things I was really interested in was the things of like your kind of intellectual genealogy, like what are the things, who are the kind of artists that, that kind of really inspire you or that you might have been influenced by or? Um... I don't know about the influenced by, because as I tell you, I went to school in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, so all of my education was completely, they don't even know who was a Caribbean artist. Mm -hmm. they, they have not the foggiest idea that, they are, that the Caribbean even produced that. It was all Kandinsky and Frank and Tyler and Miro and that, that is that is what my schooling was. Mm. I had to unschool myself when I returned to the Caribbean. People like Philip Moore and George Simon were hugely exciting to me. Mm. Philip Moore has an atavistic retention of, of, of African uh, um, cultural um, realities. Mm. George Simon is unearthing a local aesthetic, bringing forth new 
uh, forms, new expressions that have no bearing on Europe and what Europe determines uh, aesthetically. So I am allied to, not that my work reflects that, my, my, my appreciation, my interest lies more in Philip Moore and George Simon than it does in the School of Paris works of Stanley Greaves. Mm. My interest is more in the, the works of Camus Braffitt, who understands that a hurricane don't roar in a pentameter, than Derek Walker, who is whis whispered tones of, of Eurocentricity. Mm. Uh, George Lamin, who recognizes our worth is a hugely interesting to me in the castle of my skin is the very first book that launches him uh, on the international scene he recognizes us as being worthy as against via snipe paul whose view is nothing was ever made in the caribbean mm. so it is that's that's interesting so how what's what was your relationship like with your father then because if he if he had a kind of maybe a class affected by ideas of class and status and you're, you don't, you aren't, I mean, you know, how, how did that affect your relationship with your fa father or did it? Um, we had a very complex relationship. Uh, he was a man who recognized his responsibility was to nurture his children. And so when I came of age to make a decision, he supported it, even though he may not have taught, like for instance, my decision to go to art school cautioned me that you know this is a I don't know how you are going to manage your life you you see what goes on in this society with artists nobody is really an artist people are teachers and broadcasters what are you going to do with art you could you could why don't you do accountancy because <laughs> I got a distinction in mathematics <laughs> You, um, I, I like that you have a distinction in mathematics, but no money. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a feat. <laughs> what does mathematics have to do with money? Well, at least you count it. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I went into counting money. I worked at the bank. I went into keeping other people's money. I had the keys to the vault. <laughs> that's the closest I got to money. <laughs> Oh, what, were we, what were we talking about? Well, about we were talking that? about the influences or, or people that you'd admired, yeah, right. like George Simon, Philip Moore, right, right, right. you know. George Simon and his brother, um, yeah. Oswald, Oswald yeah. Hussein. I mean, they bring the most, they bring the most miraculous things. Mm. They're completely different. They're coming out of a completely different aesthetic. Yeah. yeah? So that sort of stuff interests me. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I, I realized actually we, we, we'd moved on from that to talk about your relationship with your father and him saying yeah, right, that's, right, how right. We, that's yeah. where we got to, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm telling you, um, yeah. though he had his view of the world, he was prepared to put himself solidly behind his children. Okay. He was a man who um, didn't have a formal education. He was self-educated and um, he made sure that all of his children had a tertiary education. That inspiration flowed on. All of his children's children have tertiary educations. Their children are coming on stream now. Several of them are in university. He has nine grandchildren and four children. Their training spans the full range of possibility. We have from a genetic engineer to studio artist. So his, though he may not have been of a mindset that uh, that that I followed, he had basic approaches to family that were solid. Mm. He supported us all with whatever it is we wanted to do, even if it were things that he did not think were the things we should do. Huh? So in, my interest in art did not conflict with him. Or my wish to study art, he supported that fully, fully. So, um, but in terms of his, his, his attitude to, to society, his, his ranking, his, 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 his his ideas about hierarchy in society. I didn't share any of those ideas. And so those things put us in conflict, but we managed those conflicts uh, well. It never became a problem as such. He understood it, but I was of a different elk and he, he was the way he was and I was different. And this is something I think you have to expect with children when you have children. You can't expect that your children are going to be like you. I have two daughters, they're quite unlike me. <laughs> <laughs> they marvel me sometimes. I wonder, who are you all? 
<laughs> yeah no i think a lot of parents have that experience that's how that's how the generations that's how the world the world progresses yeah yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so well i mean when when were you last in um guyana do you i mean oh, i was not in guyana i was not in guyana until uh, i was in guyana in 2011 2011 is the last time i was in guyana i'm really quite fed up with guyana I am really quite fed up with that. You know, take for instance, Rupert Rupnar. Rupert was, in my view, one of the most revolutionary of Caribbean politicians. He sold himself and his party to their tormentors, cheap, 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 cheap. I was done. I was done when that happened. I can't understand how it happened. They got nothing for it, but this is not about politics. No, <laughs> no, I, I, I understand that, but I also think you know, probably after so many years of being kind of at the margins of politics, you know, that that maybe he felt that being inside of politics, he might have been able to make some sort of impact. I think the unfortunate I thing is, is, is the greatest impact on politics in Guyana. Yeah. without holding office. No, that's true. Though you never should, in my estimation, have run for elected office. Yeah. Their strength was in their capacity to stimulate thinking in the people. Mm. Yeah. From the time they wanted to hold office, they, they, they began to go downhill. <laughs> what, what's your view on what went wrong? I mean, like, what went wrong? When did it go wrong with Guyana? Because, you know, it doesn't, it, it feels like it, it just doesn't get any better. It doesn't. Um, it's a very complex question. This thing goes back to um, to the Americans not wishing Cherry Jagan to come into control of the British colony that was British Guyana. And so they persuaded and engineered the British into uh, ousting him. But whom they ousted him for proved I think even more problematic for them and for us. Yeah. And in addition to that, what it did was to set off a race war. Not that there was not ethnic conflict before, but <clears throat> the original PPP brought together the ethnicities in an understanding that we can move forward as a people, as a one people. The, the fracturing of that of that uh, original PPP is what set off all of these problems that we are having now. The, these problems are all based in ethnic conflict, oh. and they are perpetuated by a constitution that does not give people the capacity to choose their own leaders in their own constituencies. It is the president who is choosing your representative. You have no say in the matter. So when he chooses to support or not support or whatever he does in the parliament, it is not you he's allied to, it is his party leader. That is the essence of the problem. We need constitutional change. When we have a constitution that empowers the people, that country will change radically. But no party, though they oppose that constitution when they're in opposition, oppose it when they are in power because it is facilitating for power. Yeah. So nobody wants to change it. They only want to change it when they're outside. It's very I, Rupna Rain. I made a program with Rupna Rain hmm. that went through the history of the, of the establishment of the 1980 slave constitution. But he sat down in, um, in, uh, in President Granger's cabinet under the same constitution. He seemed comfortable. I mean, the, the thing I find interesting is like a, a, most, a lot of the people I speak to say, oh, they've had enough of Guyana, but a little bit like you, the, I feel that your work is still very rooted in Guyana and very influenced yeah. by the Guyanese context. It most certainly is. It most certainly is. It is a preoccupation. I am disillusioned with the way it has gone, mm -hmm. but I am not separated from it. I'm very much a Guyanese, I'm very much concerned with Guyana, but I find it practically impossible to participate mm. in how things are done there. You know, we have a national gallery that I don't know what it is. <laughs> we have an art school that I don't know what it is. 
Dennis Williams, when he when he set up that art school, it was a poor copy of the art school he went to. We had an art school only to be able to say we had an art school. Dennis Williams could not get his tutors paid their salaries at the end of the month. The school had no equipment, no, no materials. But yet it has turned out artists of significance because we as Guyanese people are very innovative. We it, can do anything. It's one of the things that really so fascinates. We can override any problem. Mm. If given half a chance, yeah. that country would be, you know, half a chance. Mm. So we establish an art school, we don't fund it, we don't, we hardly pay the teachers, we don't equip it. And the people have to make something of it. These 16 and 17, 18 year olds who, go, who entered into that school. And the next thing about who, who enters into that school, a lot of problematic people enter into that school because anybody, who has the capacity to shoot off to a foreign university will do so. Art is a last resort. Even if they have a capacity for art, they will leave that behind and go to the accountancy, go to the engineering, go to the medicine. So the people who come into the art school are the dregs of the secondary school. They are the failures. Mm. It is very hard to make something of them. They are hugely indisciplined. So the art school is a very problematic place. Another aspect of that, another problem with that art school is that it is staffed almost entirely by its own former students. That's an incestuous kind of relationship. So there is no advance. It is a regurgitation is what is going on. So you following that? when you were there in 2011, did you spend time with any of the artists that were on the ground there? No, I was, you know, Winslow nine, Craig. I was sick for the nine days that I was there. Oh no! I didn't see anybody. <laughs> no, I was just wondering because it, it fascinates me the number of artists that have come out of Guyana, given that it's not really a culture that's a, it's not really a society that supports cultural expression, you know, and it, and it certainly doesn't ever want to financially reward people, um, you know, for their literature, for their poetry, for whatever, for their art. Um, but there's definitely a, a cohort of a particular age group. Um, I think now looking, um, you know, I left Guyana, I think in 2015. And I think at the time there weren't that many art artists. There's still a lot of people very determined, you know, quite a few people who are very determined to become artists and who were working as artists. But I think it's definitely far less supportive of, of art, if that's possible, than it was even in, in your day. Oh, yeah, certainly. certainly. Um, I was looking at a program with Bert Carter. Mm. He's an civil engineer who's very much concerned with the, uh, the architecture the of, uh, of uh, the buildings mm. in Georgetown. He said um, that he had, had an expectation that with David Granger being an, a historian and all of that, that for instance, the city hall would have been a structure that, uh, that they would have tried to save, but nothing happened. Um, the palms fell down on itself, but it was restored. It was restored by, and he, he terms the previous government, the government before Granger, as having a, a more interest in agriculture. So he was expecting anything from them. But this historian, he expected, but nothing happened. Mm. So I, don't, I don't know what is the matter with that country. We have a very weird, at, Attitude to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> we seem no. to not matter to our own self. I know, and, 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 and um, you know, Bert Carter is one of Guyana's treasures. I think we're actually hoping to have yeah. him on uh, Guyana Speaks at some yeah. point to talk about That's the right. the older, you know, the older buildings, the traditional kind yep. of buildings. Yep. Um, He's hugely knowledgeable about that stuff. Yeah, very. He can tell you all the dates when they were opened, when they were built, who built them, tell you everything about them. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so, um, I mean, I hope, could you talk to us a little bit about your technique? So if I bring up um, an image, I'm going to see if I can share the screen. And um, for example, let me put you, actually, we never spoke about this photograph of your father. Let me pop you there. Can you tell me something about this, this uh, painting of your father? It tells itself. There's it nothing does. for me to say. Mm. <laughs> is it is it is it um done in a kind of watercolor or no 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 it's a pastel drawing. Oh it's a pa okay. Okay. Mm. Mm. 
So is it is it something that you painted recently or you, you produced recently? 2017, 2017. 2017, yes, already okay. Passed. Okay. You already passed. Um, mm. Now, let me see. Oh, here we are. Let me go down here. And then there's this collection here. Like these are all done oh. in a similar technique. And what's what? What is it? Like how? What? 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 What, what would I even call it? <laughs> you know what this is is really. Um, these were done for an architectural firm, a Jamaican architectural firm, for their complementary calendar. So what I did was to um, make drawings of buildings around the Caribbean. And to uh, and to color them in the aromatic emotive color of the flora of the Caribbean. I didn't bother with trying to render them realistically. I thought that I would combine the flora, the magnificent color of the Caribbean, with these with these forms that constitute these buildings. There's Stabrook, and there's a, there's the uh, there's a cathedral. In, um, in Jamaica, the Benab, the art school in Cuba, the Red House, the, um, the, uh, a building in the, in the, in the red light district in Barbados. The, the second building in the bottom column, in the bottom row, yeah. is the building in which I was born. Sorry, say that again, where is it? In, uh, in Newtown Kitty, the illustration. Oh. In the, in the last row, the second picture in the last row. Yeah, that's one in the, here. in the last row. That's the right. That's the building in which I was born in Newtown Kitty. No. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Very nice. I mean, I can. Re it looks like a Kitty building, actually. It. Re it. Re I when I first saw it, I was wondering if it was from um, the Kitty Market building. But very it, near, yeah. very near to the Kitty Market. But, yeah. yeah. And the one next to it is the post office. In, in Jamaica, I forget I forget all the details of it now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this one is a ruined castle in Haiti. This the second row, the last picture in the second row. This one. Uh huh. Uh huh. So, but how how is it actually produced? I mean, it looks almost like uh -huh. it's. Is it transposed somehow, like film, or like what, what is it? Like it, it, what um medium is it? It's uh, Indian inks. Oh. Okay. India ink. Wow, because it gives it a very translucent, very light, yet very powerful. Um, you know, the colors are so rich, and yet it's got a very light uh, feel to it. You know, the surface of it. It's really, it's really very beautiful. I really like the Benab, the second one in the first row. Yes. I like all of them, really. <laughs> the first one is a cathedral in Jamaica. I forgot the name of the cathedral now. The one, the one before it. Uh -huh. This one. Cathedral oh. in Jamaica. Okay, so oh. does this mean that you've you've traveled a lot around the Caribbean, lots of different well, places? I used to work, you know, um, I used to work out at the Caribbean Development Bank for a few years, oh, okay. and what I did with them was I documented their projects in eighteen member countries. So I regularly traveled to eighteen Caribbean. I went to eighteen Caribbean countries three times a year. <laughs> wow, that's that's lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody says that, but when I was doing it. It didn't feel so. It was a hell of a lot of work, you know. And so yeah. I, I, I would document these projects uh, with film, and with uh, with still film, and with uh, video. But this was analog video. These were cameras this big. Yeah, heavy. <laughs> and they were not camcorders. That's just a camera. The recorder is this big now. Mm. The, the 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 case of lights. So it was a hell of a struggle to move around all these places with all of this equipment by myself. Yeah. You know? um, but what, it was what, interesting to be able to go to all of these. But you know, half the time I don't, I couldn't remember which island I was in. I would be in a taxi wondering, hey, St. Vincent or Grenada? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm in these places for three days, you know? <laughs> I'm in Grenada for three days, the next time I'm, I'm in St. Vincent, and I'm in Dominica, and St. Lucia, and yeah. St. Kaipas, and the Cayman, and you know? Three times a year I'm doing this. So I was able to, sometimes I was able to, on, on my own time, mm. take a couple of photographs with things that I would reference to myself, you know. But yeah. my main business was documenting the, the, the CDBs, the Caribbean Development Bank's projects. Mm. Now, after I left their employ, I still worked with them as a consultant. And in that capacity, 
I made training films. And I made films that um, of the works that they sponsored. So for instance, I would go to Jamaica to look at bakers whom they gave grants or aid to how they were progressing, what work they did. So I would go to Jamaica, I would go to St. Kitts, I would go. To, so again, I was doing the same, same traveling around. So I, yes, I traveled around a lot in the Hello. Caribbean. Yeah. So I, 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 I style myself as a Caribbean artist more than as a Guyanese artist. I'm born in Guyana, but I'm very Caribbean oriented because of that exposure mm. that the bank gave me. You know, and the, and it's funny because you can you can always and their feel projects the, were in, their projects were in all of the sectors. They were in industry, they were in agriculture, they were in tourism, they were in infrastructure. So I got to interact with the with the persons of significance in all of these areas and to hear their stories and you know. So I got I, I got to, to 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 acquire a, a, a real understanding mm. of the Caribbean. So it made me into a Caribbean man. <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. I, in terms of, um, it's like when I look at your paintings, they always feel very warm. Like there's like a warmth. This one. Yeah, this and one, I mean, from the years that I lived in Barbados. Okay. We got, we, we got held up in our home. We lived in Bel Air Park, a nice neighborhood. But we came home one evening, and um, my wife thought something is funny here. I says, What? Nothing is there. She says, look, the door is slightly open. So we parked the car outside. I went up to the door. Before I could get to the door, somebody's coming out of the house with a gun. <laughs> My wife backpedaling, tumbles upside down. My children are running up the road. The man is accosting me with this, backing me up with this gun. My wife said, hey, you're done with this bullshit country. You have to go. So we went to Barbados. My children were failing in the school also. They, I worked hard to get them into Queen's College. I failed by nine marks well, to get to Queen's College. So well, I was intent that they would get there. Yeah. They both got there. But they would come home and say to me, I said to them, what you all did today? I said, nothing. I said, how you mean nothing? I said, no teacher didn't come. I said, what you mean? No teacher came to the class. Yeah. All the teachers are traders They're in Suriname or Trinidad or somewhere, I don't know where. So. They weren't doing so well. We went to Barbados. They did marvelously. Won scholarships to universities in America. They did wonderfully well. Mm, that's <laughs> so we spent about 12 or 13 years in Barbados. And so whilst I was in Barbados, I, was, I didn't have this pressure of the politics of Guyana. Mm. So my output lightened up. Beach house. <laughs> bread <for three. laughs> and, you, and you threw in a naked lady there somewhere. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm interested in naked ladies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's de it's definitely one of the most um, relaxing images. Uh -huh. I think, like uh, the least tension going on in that, yeah, right. that uh, image. That is, what, that is how the that is what the Barbados years did. <laughs> <laughs> we love Barbados, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I guess um, uh, did you had family in Barbados, no? Or yeah, this is because you this is another strange thing. I told you. Yeah, my father, father was from Barbadian immigrants. Right. I returned to Barbados a hundred years exactly after. Crazy. They wow. Came to but there, I look in the news in the, uh, in the in the telephone directory, pages and pages and pages of booster. I don't know not a single one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I'm in a country in which I have no relation to anybody. I don't know anybody, and not related to anybody. I got a fence for myself. <laughs> <laughs> you, you could have just phoned around some of the numbers. <laughs> I know any of them, not one. Not a single one. Oh dear. Yeah. yeah no. <laughs> but this is really <laughs> lovely. I, I, I do like this. Um... It's lovely to be in Barbados. We loved it. Mm -hmm. So then, what about this one? I mean, this is another oh. one that's really powerful. I love it. These two, these two are my students. They were, I made this picture the first year. I was teaching at the Borough School of Art. I was very interested in trains. And I was terribly saddened that the trains had fell into such disrepute. In fact, I used the fact that the, that the trains fell into destitution, that they became garbage. Mm. As, a, as a, what do you call it in English now? Uh, as an analogy 
for the way the country went down. It's called Beware the Promise of Today. Do you know it? Mm, no. You don't know it. No. I got to get myself out there in the world. <laughs> you gonna no, you know, it's, 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 it's because I'm, a, I'm only an honorary Guyanese. I'm sure if I was a true, uh, true, you look, true. You look so like us that I think you're Guyanese. <laughs> No. You look like my sister 20, 20 years ago, you know? You look just like my sister would look. Well, I, I feel Guyanese, but every now and then I, I realize mm, I missed out on certain parts of it, but I try and no, catch but beware, up. But Beware the Promise Today is a relatively new work. I did it, I think, in 2019. Mm. It's a photo essay. Right. It used this photograph and I think 19 others to tell the story of Guyana's political demise. You should look for it on the internet i will do i will do uh -huh. but i love this because so, um, so this this like, um... i can tell you a little bit of the technique of this photograph please yeah. these are two photographs the photograph of the women in the carriage and the photograph of the carriage merged and solarized but i don't like to talk about technique because i see myself really in addition to being a gorilla i'm also a magician <laughs> and i see myself as producing magic and if you tell people how you make magic, then it's it's true. I th that's actually one of the things that um, attracted me to your art because every time I look at an image, I'm like, "Wow, <laughs> how did you do that?" I when people ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> how did you do that? But, but, but this was what what it, that? Is, was this an image of um uh, was this a derelict coach? Because all yes, I've yes, ever yes. seen in in Guyana is the uh, d the derelict uh, railway line, but I never see I've never seen the coaches. At this time, this is um this is 1970, 1977. Oh, I see. The carriages and the engines were still in the yard. Wow. They were completely overgrown and deteriorated. Yeah. So this is one such carriage that I posed these two students of mine in. Yeah. And then I superimposed the same carriage so that they seem they appear like apparitions rather than like people mm. because they are representing the africans and the indians of time gone who yeah. traveled on that train huh? mm. they're not present in life now mm -hmm. so you can see through them yeah. through the rubble yeah. of the carriage huh? yeah. <laughs> yeah no it's very powerful so let I, me I love, um i love that image too but you know it's an one. interesting you know, what, you know what is really upsetting? A lot of things upset me every time. Like I told you, I taught at the art school for many years. Mm -hmm. I eventually headed that school. You know, not a single work of mine is in the national collection. Not a single one, not one. But students of the school's works are in that collection. How I hide in the school and I'm not in the collection? Huh? How, how is that? <laughs> you can explain I, I, so is your work in um castellani house that's what i'm telling you that's castellani what you're that's what house you're referring to okay. not a single work of mine is in there oh i see okay. fact, let me tell you the story i was once formally appointed as an advisor to the minister of culture youth and sports in that capacity she invited me onto a committee to consider the redevelopment of the castellani house I being how I am, don't just go to the meeting. I write to the Castellani House requesting their files of their activities over the last five years. Say. Days and days and weeks and weeks are going by, I cannot get these files. They're calling the meetings and I'm not going. They can't form a quorum so nothing can go forward. They are hiding the files of their activities. When finally they are forced to produce them, and I go to them and I'm not going through them for this purpose. I go to them. I see that all of the activities that I have been involved with at the Castellani house, the screening of my films, there are none of them listed. They have all been excised. Has, has any of your we work- We have a culture of malice. We deal with our, we deal with our life on a malicious basis. Mm. Management by malice is what was happening at the Castellani house. You see, because I was a, I was own way kind of, like a, a guerrilla warrior, mm. art warrior. I don't, you know, I do what I feel like doing. And okay. it just happens that I always feel like doing the right thing. Mm. It just happens that that is so. But people don't like that. People like to be able to manipulate. Mm. 
manipulate you. The guy manipulates you, then you're out. So I was out from the castle. And he'll say, I'm out. Mm. When I'd like, I'd I like to think um, things might be different now. <laughs> I don't know. But I, I, I really shouldn't speak as, uh, as I am about this situation because I've been away from it for a long time. Yeah, I, I, don't really I, know what is, I don't really, really know what is, what is operative on the ground now. Mm. All these things that I'm telling you, you got to step them in the context of yeah, what time yeah, yeah, so This yeah. is what time story be doing. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially one of the people who are in the fray of things now to get a sense of what's happening now. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you what was happening in my time. Mm. One of the things that, like, for instance, that Carrie Festo uh, thing that I tell you about, is I, can't, I, I made up several 31 panels of the activity. I constituted it from, yes. Carrie Festo 72? Mm. Yes. When, the, when in 1992, the PPP government won the election and formed the government. The Minister of Culture, Youth and Sport, Gilda Shearer, decided to form a committee to examine how to restructure the borough school of art. This is how I'm going to get onto the committee for the Castellani House. I was forced on the one for the, uh, for the borough oh, school. I see. So we considered uh, one of the things that arose out of those considerations was that the school should move from where it is. It was at the time on Carmichael Street in a building that was practically falling down. The toilets didn't work. The toilets didn't work. So he arranged for us to have the building that the Department of Culture uh, was in. And they were in a very fine structure on Cass Carifester Avenue at the entrance to the National Park. The Ministry of Culture itself was in a huge building on Main and Kwamina Street. And the minister felt that she could easily accommodate that whole department in the head office of the ministry. And that that building that the Department of Culture had been in could become when it was re, what's the word for that? Um, when, you, when you do over buildings, what do you call that? Reconstruction. Yeah, refurbishment. Renovation, yeah. renovation, renovation. Renovation. That with renovations for a purpose, it could serve as a, as a really nice art school in the mm -hmm. park, nice environments. Great, wonderful. When I went to inspect the building after the department moved out. I found that they had trashed the building completely. All of the government's records of its activities culturally, its Guyana, um, its exchanges with Cuba, it's strewn all over the floor, a complete mess. I have a videotape of it, I'm just talking shit. I have the document, like I tell you, I said, I'm gonna win the whole day. I'm a documentarian. <laughs> <laughs> I have the videotape of the mess that they made of, the, of their records. I went through the mess collecting photographs and whatever I could collect. My interest is in Carifesta and cultural matters, so I collect all the Carifesta pictures. And I restored them to the archives of the ministry. But before I restored them, I photographed them all. Then over, over the course of time, many, many years would pass. I um, went to the archives in Guyana and in Barbados to research the reporting on Carifesta. And so the writing that accompanies the photographs, and I have no idea who took the photographs, except that I know for sure that they were the photographs of the government information service photographers, but which photographer, I have no idea about. The records were completely um, messed up. Mm. Huh? The strewn on the floor, the so. cabinets thrown down, all this stuff. So, uh, <clears throat> So that is how these things came about. The problem that it poses for me is how am I going to publish these photographs? And I don't know whose photographs they are. You know? Mm. But I know that they are the government's photographs. <laughs> but whether I could get permission from the government to use them in a publication, I don't know. So I don't know how, how I'm going to get it published as a book, but I do know that I can put them out on social media. And so I'm going to come back to you about that in mm. time, because I'd like to have all 31 of them uh, available to the public on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of this festival. And really, really, if we had a government that was concerned with us, we would be hosting a festival, whether virtually or actually, in 2022 to celebrate our birthing of this festival mm. of Cari Festa. But I understand that it is to be held by somebody else. Somebody <laughs> else took the initiative. Take our own baby out our hand. Yeah. 
You think we easy? You think we easy with being stupid? Mm. I, 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 it's interesting, actually, you're saying we were talking earlier about the impact of, you know, Chetty versus Burnham, but Cara Festa and, um, um, you know, Mashramani and things like that seem to have been one of the one of the really positive things that came out of the, the Burnham era. Yeah, but it didn't just come out of it um, because of their good graces. The Burnham government used foreign policy as a tool to fool the world that it was a progressive government. All of these people who came to Caiaphas had no idea what we were going through. They just thought that it was a wonderful place, it was a wonderful thing we were doing, and it was a wonderful thing that we were doing, hosting this Kari Festa. Another idea is that Burnham um, conceptualized this festival, not true. We had in 1970, at the same time that we had the Conference of Non-Aligned Nations, a conference of Caribbean artists and writers. It is out of the proceedings of that conference that the idea of Kari Festa came about. Burnham was greatly facilitating in getting it done and so, getting so, all of the other countries. So who were the who were the key protagonists in that in that 1970s uh, conference? You need to read Georgetown Journal by Andrew Salkey. Oh, Andrew Salkey, yeah. And yeah everything yeah. about it. Oh, so, Georgetown okay. Journal. You read that book and you'll understand everything. Yeah, yeah. How Kari Festa came about. <clears throat> I couldn't begin to tell you. My memory yeah. is too gone. I don't remember. <laughs> people like Do Austin you... Clark, people like Camel yeah, Graffit, uh, yeah. people like um, Errol Hill, uh, and those were the those were the luminaries of that time, mm. you know, who uh, who were involved in this in the in the symposia and in the planning committees and you know. I see. Yeah, yeah. And and what about with uh, Mashramani? I don't really know about Mashramani. Right. Mashramani was a political construct, really. Right. Right. You know? okay. um, All right. So at, at the service, whew, Lord. Oh boy, make the small man a real man. That's the answer to that slogan there. Pure, empty sloganeering. This mm -hmm. is the reality. Mm -hmm. People were, people were falling down in the street. Yeah. People couldn't get bread to buy. People couldn't work anywhere unless you had a PNC card. Mm. Life was rough. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Make no small man a real man. It's, it's just political slogan here. This is the reality that people face. Mm. Yeah, mm. There's, there's some some other really, I really like this one as well in terms of the- Whoa. workers. You know, the workers. Workers. Yeah, really. The backbone. Mm. Rice, agriculture, sustainable pro uh, produce, quick turnaround, mm. farm market next day. Money, more day, you know? So did you get to travel around a lot of Guyana? I mean, did you go all over the place or? Lordy, lordy, lordy. I traveled all over that country, yeah. Okay. I have a film. I, have a film. Uh, I made a film with Bobby Finance. Guyana, my memory is really short. All of them are on YouTube. Look on YouTube. I'll have a look on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. My I like channel. this. This, this one was good. Give us our daily bread, you know, talking about. So is this also the Burnham era? This is it. Yeah. That's the struggle, friend. Mm. Sirens whizzing by while people struggling in their life. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, have I gone through all of these already? I might have gone through all the pictures that we had on. Actually, this was another. This was another photograph. Oh, I just well, well, you know, we often we, we uh, in the Caribbean we don't have uh, our arts are not terribly predictive. Mm. This is a completely prophetic picture. Yes, so tell me when you produced this. When did you produce it? I remember the dates. But it was before year. the uh, election, right? Oh yes. Mm. <clears throat> I had coffee come down off of that pedestal and walk over to the parliament building and call them to order. Understand? Yeah. Five, five days after I posted this picture on, on Facebook, mm -hmm. it was done. It yeah. was done. The mama guying was done. Call to order. Come out the place. Come out the place. 
<laughs> I, I I really like the um in this image the rat. You know, like you've got this this the actually I th was it just one rat? I last time I looked I thought there were no. more rats. Another one there. But on the uh, and another one over there somewhere. Another one there. And I the wish I made them up enough. Yeah. I love this, the image of coffee on that. It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. That's well, amazing. Coffee is sending his messenger birds. His messenger uh, birds, yeah. Yeah. Blowing them out, yeah. And, yeah, grab them off the place, man. Come. <laughs> I have another one. Um, I have another one. You know, it's funny. The situation in Ghana mm -hmm. was very similar to the situation right here in America. I have another rat one about America. <laughs> You know, I thought what was going on in Guyana was terrible, but I think America actually managed to be even worse. I don't know. I don't know. That was just the same thing. It's the same thing, really. It's just as bad as each dictator, other, right? The wannabe dictator trying to hold on to power. Yeah, yeah. This one now is a Barbadian thing. This is Errol Barrow. Errol Barrow, okay. This is, this an, is another awesome. magic, magic. You know, I. I need to ask you a question. There's something about spirit in 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 your image. Is it is a what is what is this? What is your connection to spirit? I mean, what does it mean for you in your artwork? Because it's it seems to come through. Hard to talk about it. I don't know where to begin. Um, I mean, really is, is it some, is it something like channeling? Is it? I mean, do you feel like almost like a a yeah, like a vessel, like you're you're a vessel for very much, very much. Oh, it's the channel. Like the channel. These things are from me. True. Yeah. You no? Know? That's why it's hard for me to talk about them. Yeah. I myself don't really fully understand them. <laughs> but I, I love I love that somehow you managed to to communicate that in there. And it's something to for me anyway, it's something to do with the lightness of the images. You know, it's very even though like you've they look like multi-layered images but yet the they whole are. the whole composite together comes across as very light it's it's really interesting it's 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 magic <laughs> it's magic <laughs> it really is, is magic. Barrow work, this is Barrow working for his people man Barrow is a people <laughs> politician you know yeah yeah stop death from malnutrition that's what that one says the other one that you were at oh this one the the yeah. um Hang on, let me go back. Yeah. This one, yeah, that was another. That's another powerful. So I did very well in telling you about them, but I did pretty well telling about them in the film Forty Pieces: The Political Art of Errol. Mm. So if you look at that film, you get a, a better understanding of all of these pictures. These placards are saying "Stop Death from Malnutrition," whilst mm. this pretend general in his uniform, Commander in Chief, yeah, taking a salute. As people are punishing, he's saluting. Behind him yeah. is the trajectory of Caribbean development. Beginning, not at the beginning, mm. but beginning in this picture with Columbus coming through coffee. Yeah. To wind up in the tobacco. Things are getting worse and worse all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's at the stage here now where people are protesting, stop death from malnutrition. Lord, you know how hard the times were. You can understand how hard the times were. Mm. What year is this? Do you do, you do um, things do you like for, for book covers and things like that? Do you do artwork? Well, well, I designed the book, the, the, the annual report covers for the Caribbean Development Bank mm -hmm. for years. I done a oh, couple okay. of um, Roy Brummel, Roy mm -hmm. Brummel. I did a, a couple Brummel. of Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Graphic arts is my thing, you know, so I've done a lot yeah. of that kind of So yeah. I just have a couple of, I don't want to go on for too long. I've just got like maybe two more questions. Um, one, I'd like, how, how would you like people to be remembered? I know you've told me off because I, I should know a lot more about your work than I do. <laughs> um, well, but, I don't know that you should. I know that I have been trying for a long time. Yeah. So that you would, but I am <laughs> Well, I do, I do look at your, I mean, I, I, do you know what? I'm very interested in image. So I tend to look at image, but I don't tend to um, explore the artist necessarily. I just, I just love the image, you know? <laughs> 
So that's, I'm, that's I'm what it's all about. Yeah, well, I'm a bit. <laughs> but um, is a do you have um, you know what? How do you see your legacy? I mean, is it in terms of? I, I've been interested to see if there were any books that you know, um, compendiums of your work, that kind of thing. No, 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 no. I'm completely ignored. No, no, no. I, like I tell you, I'm the unknown soldier. I am the unknown soldier. I think that has to be rectified, Errol. <laughs> Um, I think that has to be rectified. Away from what I wanted to say, something in response to the last question you asked. Oh, how I want to be remembered. Yes. Again, again I refer you to um, the drawn portraiture of ERB. At the beginning of that short film, I say that the way in which I wish to be remembered is as multifaceted, mysterious, and what? Multifaceted mysterious and memorable. That's how I'd like, that's what I wish for my work really. Not for me, for my work. I, I'm, no, I'm an inconsequential, I'm nobody, really. I don't need to be anybody. It's better for me to be nobody. I can do what I want when I'm nobody. <laughs> You'll definitely be remembered as mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> and multifaceted. And multifaceted. And multifaceted. <laughs> well, I'll be memorable the whole not a matter. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I, I mean, I just, I, I really want people in the UK to know more about your work, which is really why I wanted you on this guy and a speaks. Well, I'm sorry I behaved so badly and I hope no, I didn't. No, if, if you <laughs> had behaved well, they wouldn't have believed you were Guyanese. <laughs> <laughs> No, but you know, we, we it, it's just, it's such a, we're very fortunate to have had you speaking to us about this. And I know many people will really enjoy having seen your work. And of course, a lot of your work is online on YouTube, on Vimeo. So I'll just be chucking all the links out there. Um, I'm now afraid to not comment on the links. <laughs> I'll have to do a write up for each one. <laughs> I have to. I have to escape your lashes, so, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Thank you for inviting me on your panel. Thank you. I hope you. that um, I'm a little better known now. <laughs> and, um, a lot better story. known. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna, I'm just gonna put it on, um, take the record off okay. and uh, you can stay online and then I can say a proper goodbye to you. But I just wanted to turn off the video. There mm -hmm. we go. There we go. So the video is off. So you're satisfied? I am satisfied. That's great. I think it's about an hour long, though. <laughs> so, yeah, because we, what time is it now? It's 5.30 and we started recording at 4.30. Oh, wow. so, I, didn't think it would go. I didn't think I had that much to say. <laughs> see, see, I was trying to make you be a little bit less mysterious. <laughs> squeeze, squeeze a little bit more out of you. But so, um, so I'll show half an hour and then I'll put the um, recording onto the guy in a speaks page. But do you want to, are you happy for me to just show it or the whole thing? You, you, you do your thing. Okay, cool. <laughs> Brilliant. So are you going to join us on Sunday or? Well, I might because now I know how to get on. I was, yeah. I don't know what to do, you know? What do I do? Just go to that thing that you sent me and click it, like I did. I'll literally, click. I'll literally. What would I be on there for now? Just to, to, I to see what goes on. Yeah, exactly. You can see what. <laughs> huh? Yeah, so because what, what I'm going to do is I've got a few, three people who I'll put on before you and then I'll have you at the end. And okay. then. Um, when you say you have me, you mean the recording? The recording, yeah. And then... How long is this going to go for? So the, the whole thing is 90 minutes. So we have... It, it, it might be slightly less than that because um, I've got a poet who I think is only going to do one poem. And they're both a poet and a singer, and they're both very young. So probably they'll only be on for like 10 minutes each. And then I've got another woman who's going to be talking about um, pottery in the Rupununi. Um, and she's going to be speaking for 20 minutes and then we'll have like a 10 minute, 15 minute Q&A with her. And then it'll be your film. So it, I, I normally gauge it on how the audience is feeling. 
<laughs> you know, because they're people I see over and over. So I can normally tell when they're feeling tired or when they want to see the whole thing or not. So I'll just, I'll gauge it on the, the day. Content you have, the, the content you have on me is way past the time that you have available to you. So what it's, it, it, exactly, exactly. So I'll put, I'll just, I'll put it for 30 minutes and then they can, um, they can watch, I'll just send them the link so they can watch the rest of it in their leisure, in their leisure time. Um, yeah and i normally also because I, I normally then convert them into um youtube links and then they get put on the um that's how they're connected to the guy in a speaks page so but, uh, i'll do my thing I'm happy, so. I'm grateful that you um chose to do something with me no i i wanted to is you being mysterious <laughs> trying to avoid it <laughs> <laughs> i'm only saying that i'm happy <laughs> I don't like these kinds of things at all. Yeah, yeah, no, but it was good. It was fun. So enjoyed it. Well, that's, that's an important thing that it was fun. You enjoyed? I enjoyed for sure. Okay. <laughs> all right, okay. Errol, thank, thank you so much. You. And we'll see you on Sunday. And I'll send you the link so that you could just click on it. Okay, great. All right. All right. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.